Hey guys, thank you for clicking on this video. I am going to talk about uh, my experiences on March 11th, 2011. These are just my experiences. They don't represent Japan as a whole, but this was what life was like for me when I was living in Tokyo on that day. My situation before the earthquake was that I had um, about six months prior moved to Tokyo. I had just finished um, a three month contract or a three year contract. I'm sorry. I was living in Saitama before that and I did my three year contract and then moved to Tokyo. I was recently engaged to Jason at the time. Uh, we were living in Sin and it was great. I was just starting out as a freelancer. I was trying to find my own. It was really difficult, but I was slowly building up business and things were going pretty good. My family was having a rough couple of years, uh, which is something I'm not really ready to talk about yet. Maybe I will some other time, but I can say that even if March 11th hadn't happened, I think that 2011 was the hardest year. I was enjoying Tokyo life. Uh, we were planning a, a wedding and it was good. Uh, also, this was before we had uh, Manechan, our dog. I am very scared of earthquakes, and this is, <laughs> I'm sure, in huge part because of the Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989 in the Bay Area uh, around the San Francisco area of California. And um, it was, I think, a 6.9 magnitude uh, on land. Uh, we were living very close to the epicenter, and it was a very scary experience. I was pretty young at the time. I remember when it happened, we were in the house. Uh, I was home with uh, dad and my brother, and my mom was out, she was on her way home. And uh, it was very scary. It felt like, I, I thought that He-Man was underneath our house, like pushing up our house, and it was so scary. And uh, I remember I couldn't stand up, so I yelled to my dad like, I can't stand up, I can't stand up. And he just told me to hold on to a tree. And I remember, um, holding on and I just, I, I still couldn't stay on there. I felt like I was just kind of flailing off. So that is why I was already afraid of earthquakes to begin with. 2.46 p.m. is when the earthquake struck. I was at home. Uh, we were living near Ikebukuro at the time. Uh, Jason was at work and I was about to leave for an appointment. It started shaking a little bit. And it's not like we don't get earthquakes out here. We, we, we get them. They're usually just pretty small. And um, it started getting gradually bigger. And my oh shit factor went off. And I was like, you know what? This, this could be bad. It was very gradual to the point where it got pants shittingly scary. And um, I, stupidly now, but I, I panicked and... I ran downstairs uh, of our building. We were on the third floor, so I ran down to the kind of lobby area where all the mailboxes were. And uh, on the way down, um, it was like a suspension bridge. So the Loma Prieta earthquake in California was more of a jarring effect. This one was more of like a swishing kind of effect. And I somehow stumbled all the way downstairs and I was just screaming obscenities. And um, I just, was like pleading with anybody somehow to make it stop and um, I was looking outside and it was just everything was just jello. Finally things were settling down. Um, I'm still kind of shaking just think about it. Uh, I went upstairs and uh, kind of checked with the neighbors like what just happened? What do we do? And they were calm as and they were just so calm, they were so cool, and they said, you know what, um, we're in a really safe area, uh, the buildings are not very high, and the buildings around us are not very high, so we won't be crushed by that. We think that the best thing to do for right now is just to lay low in our apartments and um, wait until anything develops. So I was in my apartment, I made sure that the door was open and ajar, just in case. I knew from Loma Prieta that we were going to be having some aftershocks. And I think this was one thing that mentally prepared me well that maybe um, others weren't quite ready for. Um, I, I, I went in, um, I immediately just like 
got in to see if everything was on. Uh, gas was off. It turns off automatically in earthquakes. Uh, but the electricity was still on. I immediately tried to dial out to Jason and see if he was okay and the phone wasn't working. I texted him, I emailed him uh, for about an hour. I didn't hear anything from him. I was so scared and... In the meantime, I called my parents uh, via Skype and told them what had happened and uh, I was really upset. I was at the same time watching TV and started to see everything with tsunami coming on the TV, like tsunami warnings, and uh, eventually it happened, and then I, that news started coming in. So all the meanwhile, I'm talking to my parents, I'm pretty upset, they're pretty upset. Then this footage started coming on TV that I honestly just, some defense mechanism just blocked it out. I, I couldn't comprehend it. It just wasn't happening. I was seeing these houses that were just floating away on TV, and I just couldn't handle it, I guess. I think my brain was like, you know what? Enough has happened for the day. Nothing else can happen. It's crazy what self-defense mechanisms our brains have and how they, our minds take over uh, when shit like goes, this goes down. I drew a bath, not for me, but I just drew a, a bath full of water uh, because the water was running then, but I wasn't sure what was going to be happening. And then we were also starting to get reports of the Fukushima nuclear reactors. I saw a lot of information getting pumped out, and some of it was misinformation, and some of it was valid, and some of it was just anecdotal and things that people had observed. What were you supposed to believe? What were we supposed to believe? I did my best to kind of get the information out there that I thought was... Uh, credible and from a good source and useful to other people um, that was mostly Twitter at the time this was before I was really doing a whole lot with YouTube at all <laughs> after I had finally heard from Jason and this was probably like the biggest sigh ever I was finally able to get in contact a little bit more with uh, Jason through text messaging but I knew that he had uh, you know, limited battery on his phone, so I didn't want to uh, drain his battery. But he was basically, he had walked from his office all the way to Shibuya Station, thinking that the trains were eventually going to open up. And uh, in the meantime, he enjoyed, uh, he got some curry and he went to some electronic stores. And I think he was able to charge his phone there just a little bit. Jason was still at Shibuya and he was somehow convinced that the trains were gonna start up, but when it became very much clear that they weren't, uh, he decided to walk home. And normally this would have taken about two hours, but because everybody, there was this big exodus, it took him uh, well over three hours to get home. I think when he finally got home, it was like one o'clock in the morning. I decided that, you know what, I'm just around here, um, everything is canceled for the rest of the day, and um, you know what? I need to go get dinner. So I went to the grocery store, and everything, uh, when I walked out, it was like nothing had happened. Everybody was just walking and, and going about, trying to do their thing, and the store was very calm. There were more people there than normal. Nobody was looting, nobody was hoarding, nobody was rioting, nothing like that. Bread was uh, selling out pretty quickly. Uh, toilet paper and uh, alcohol. <laughs> so after I came back, um, I got on Skype again with my family. It was really good being able to talk with them and especially my brother. He had so much faith in me and my decisions and it kind of righted me. Uh, you know, before I was a little bit reactive and then he was able to put me in the right perspective that I needed to be in and trusted that I would make the right decisions and you know I I've learned from him how to have a healthy dose of skepticism and he was able to tell my parents that the media was full of it we started getting some information about the the nuclear disaster we took that very seriously we were not in Fukushima we were quite a ways away from it uh, so we were watching that story but 
we did not react and we got a backlash for that on the other side back in the states the media just had a field day with this nuclear thing and um, was putting out a lot of misinformation disinformation the the media particularly in the states was painting tokyo as a fucking raccoon city and taking all of this nuclear disaster and lumping Tokyo in with it. There could have been a danger, there could have been a threat coming to Tokyo, but we were watching the situation, we were monitoring the situation. Uh, We had, um, my buddy had Geiger counters, um, and we were watching that just to make sure we had a plan, we knew exactly where we would go and what we would do. We told people that uh, when they asked us, but it was usually accusatory, like, you got to get the fuck out of there because Tokyo is Armageddon right now. I think that misinformation from the news outlets was intentional and uh, completely irresponsible and had devastating consequences that they're probably not even aware about or care about. There were some awful things that were said to me and Jason and our family and even to our friends and there were people just trying to make this all about them and say hurtful things and it's clear that some people don't know how to react in bad situations we heard everything uh but you know there was one comment that i found after all i see and hear about the radiation i would want them to come back to the u.s before they are forced to leave who knows how it might affect their future children to say nothing about their own bodies. Why fool around with something so serious? We all know our health is our most important value. Isn't it better to be safe? Whoever said the government and the rest of the people in the know are telling everyone the whole truth. It's just my opinion. Well, sometimes it's good to not give your opinion to somebody whose kid is actually going through this and you know nothing about. The comments like these, they just kept coming in. I was constantly updating on Twitter and Facebook, and I was really grateful that uh, my friends who had lived in Japan before were helping me disseminate information and updates. And when I had a lot of questions on my Facebook about this, this, and this, uh, you know, my my girlfriends would come in and they would like translate this thing so that my family was kept at ease and that was really helpful for me because I was trying to do so much and get to so many people. So thank you. The next few days, there were rotating blackouts, which fortunately we weren't a part of because uh, we were in the, the big bustling area of Tokyo, so to speak. So all the suburban areas had these rotating blackouts, but because we were technically in Tokyo, um, I feel like we should have because we looked out our window and there was like half of it was lights on and half of it was lights off and it was basically the same neighborhood. I feel like we should have had those blackouts as well. I reset the gas uh, and if I was doing YouTube at the time I would have made a video about it because I, I think that information was kind of hard to find on exactly how to do it. My family and friends remained extremely supportive since I basically that freelance career that I was trying for, uh, it basically was done. It was over. Um, people were being transferred, people were moving, and people just couldn't ha- have the time or the money to spend on maybe English-related activities. Since I was a, a budding translator, I used all of my newfound free time and lack of jobs to <laughs> uh, do volunteer uh, translations and information. I thought it was a really interesting experience and I met a lot of really cool people uh, and learned a lot from this. It was my first time on Google uh, Docs where we had a whole bunch of translators just tackling these documents. And normally if I've worked on Google Docs before, there's one or two other people and they're doing their thing, usually in a different language. But this one, it looked like a war was happening to the page. We were just tackling all these lines and just translating it up and before you knew it it just grew into this English translation it was it was a really cool experience for me and I was really touched that we were using 
uh, our skills to help others. This kind of volunteer translation and just getting information out there, credible information out there, kind of became my job during this time. Then there was a phenomenon called flygin. So flygin is a mix of the two words of fly, you know, to fly away, and gaijin, which is uh, essentially a word for a foreigner. Yeah, it can be used pejoratively. For now, flygin were people who bailed. They, they went home. Uh, this was looked at as being a traitor or being an awful human being. My stance on this argument if you're gonna call somebody a flygin and get pissed at their position, first of all, way to make it all about you. Way to be presumptuous about how Japan would collectively interpret these situations. Uh, people who were pissed about flygin were pissed that they gave foreigners who stayed a bad name and they were pissed that they abandoned their post and broke contracts and hurt companies and what have you. It's not your business and you don't need to judge others' life choices. We have no idea what went into those choices, what went into those decisions. And home and family mean different things to different people. You don't know that person's decision-making process. That's messed up. Don't get distracted. Just move forward and do your own thing. And when the tables are turned, like with Loma Prieta, a lot of people stayed, a lot of people left. It's what happens. So with all of these people leaving, uh, I supported either way. Um, for Jason and I made the decision to stay. That was our decision. But we didn't condemn anybody for leaving. If anything, I selfishly thought that with all of uh, these jobs opening up, that maybe I would get some work. But that's the thing, there was no work. There wasn't a whole lot of work because the country was going through some serious stuff. The country was still reeling from the Lehman shock, the economic collapse, the recession. Furthermore, the tourist industry, which is a huge chunk of the economy of Japan, was just wrecked. I mean, we had to get Lady Gaga to stick up for us. Despite all this negativity that was happening, uh, the foreign community did band together and QuakeBook emerged. This was a collaborative project which included uh, stories and photographs um, around March 11th, around everything that surrounded it. Some of it was prose, some of it was nonfiction, some of it was poetry, um, and it is translated. It's, it's bilingual. It was the first book that I've been listed uh, in. Um, this one was, um, I don't know if I was translating this one. Oh, as a copy editor in this book. With QuakeBook, I was able to meet some of people who are in my life now who are very important to me. I think that's where I first met Remiko, before she was Remiko. Things started to calm down in Tokyo. But we were in the process of setsuden, which is uh, saving power. So Tokyo kind of turned into dark Tokyo for a while there, for at least a few months. Uh, this meant that there would be less lights used and businesses, particularly in Shibuya, that had their lights on, especially big, bold lights, were criticized very sharply by neighboring businesses and the public. And uh, the trains, the inside of the trains, the lights were not on. Uh, or at nighttime they were on, but they were kind of dim. And I think that heating and air conditioning were used very, very sparingly. I think on the train, maybe not at all, which is kind of weird because that's where I like to go when the weather gets really bad. Eventually, Setsuden and everything were getting a little bit back to normal. Uh, but even the next weekend, Jason and I went into Shinjuku, and I think that it showed how Japan really felt that we were going to move forward and that we were going to be positive. We we're going to help out those people up north who needed it and try to continue to do what we do and try to help everybody out. Shinjuku is just fine. Let's take a walk. 
volunteers asking for donations for all the folks in Tohoku. Shopping, everything is open. People are donating. Beautiful day.